Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Reapy, and uh, as a, uh, I'm a past president of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association. And along with my colleague, David Hansen, and our special event staff, I would love to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. For those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, the local community of Silicon Valley and our extended community online. Uh, our goal is making all of us Renaissance men and women. We wanted to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz, sitting in class, uh, but with drinks. Uh, so David, another volunteer, he's with me tonight. We're both alumni and spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. We really miss seeing everybody in person. To try capturing that in-person feel, after tonight's talk, we'll open up an optional Zoom room for video net, um, and virtual networking and discussion. There'll be a link in the chat box and on screen at the end of this event. Please use those Zoom meeting credentials to join us in the networking space to chat about the talk and about UCSC. This time, we're adding a new dimension. We'll have some discussions in small groups for a few minutes, then we'll mix the, the groups up a few times, uh, and we're calling this speed networking. So David will have more details after the end of the talk. But tonight, we're excited to raise a virtual stein with Silvana Falcone, who founded the Human Rights Investigations Lab for the Americas. Dr. Falcone is associate professor in the Latin American um, and Latino Latina Studies Department at UCSC. She earned a PhD in sociology with a doctoral emphasis in feminist studies from the University of California at Santa Barbara. She received two postdoctoral fellowships from the UC Office of the President and the Woodrow Wilson National Foundation. She has authored or co-edited two books, Power Interrupted, Anti-Racist and Feminist Activists Inside the United Nations, and New Directions in Feminism and Human Rights. We'll take your questions via Zoom's Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. You don't need to wait to submit your questions. You can type them at any time. If you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask that question sooner. This talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and our follow-up emails. Okay, does everyone have their stein? Great, I've got your slug, Professor Falcone. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be with you tonight. Um, I will hold off on my Stein until after I get through um, the lecture for tonight. Um, so thanks again for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation um, with our alumni and community members, um, parents, students, uh, whoever is here um, in the room. Um, before I start kind of getting a sense of actually who's in the virtual room, um, I felt it was important to start off by talking about uh, what I sort of see as the as the white elephant in the room, if you will. Um, we've gone through quite a week in this country um, since last Tuesday, and it's been a very anxious week for a lot of us. It's been um, a, a hard to sleep week for a lot of us. And so, I think there's a lot of ways to think about uh, what's happened for the last several days. And I think what is happening, going to be happening for the next um, uh, couple of months here as we go into a major transition in the country. And so one way that I wanna think about this moment is as, um, as a human rights scholar, as someone who is extremely concerned about the the sort of tenor um, uh, the the sort of temperature in the in the room, if you will, of what's happening and what that in fact means um, for the status of human rights. In some ways, um, an incoming administration, a new one, uh, is a new day for human rights on the global stage. Um, I don't think it should be um, taken lightly that our even though our our human rights record in the United States is a mixed one. Um, when it comes to human rights, it nonetheless, um, the ways in which we condemn wrongdoing, the ways in which we apply political pressure, that did in fact um, make a difference in the world um, when it comes to uh, preserving human rights. And I think when, you know, for quite frankly, for me, when um, uh, Jamal Koshigi from the Washington Post 
was um, brutally murdered and there was no US response to that brutality is when um, you know it was it was a real clear message to the world that um, that our leadership and our place in condemning those kinds of targeting of journalists and that brutality was no longer going to be expected. Um, it, it was almost unthinkable um, to think that something like that could happen to a Washington Post journalist, and that there would not be a strong U.S. condemnation. And so that for me was really, um, you know, there's been many turning points, I think, in the last few years around human rights, but that to me was really crystallized. Um, we were in trouble um, that no longer could we even um, forcefully condemn such an egregious um, act. And so with that, I think when we talk about, as I will this evening, the evolving practice of human rights accountability, Part of what that means is that the strategies of accountability can shift. Um, the, the methods that maybe were useful at one point um, change depending on who are uh, you know, occupying particular positions of power within the government. But those strategies don't go anywhere if we don't have a shared understanding um, around, uh, around um, livelihoods, around um, protecting journalists around um, you know, condemning uh, acts of genocide, if we don't have that shared outrage, it becomes very, very difficult to think strategically about how do you achieve accountability. So I, th I think the last few years have been particularly uh, tricky for the human rights community to think about what avenues um, one can pursue. And so I'm hopeful that things will, will change here with the new administration, but I think what will continue to remain ever present are the disinformation and misinformation campaigns that we're seeing um, really quite frankly on, on an unprecedented level right now. And so when we think about the disinformation and misinformation campaigns uh, that are happening online, you know, as, as a, scholar of human rights, I often think like, who is the accountable person? Who is the accountable entity? What is the accountable unit to, um, to actually stop uh, these, these campaigns of disinformation and misinformation? Because it's affecting people. It, it, it in some ways creates, um, it raises the stakes for preserving and protecting human rights. And so in many ways, this evolving practice um, that I wanna talk about tonight is ever increasing in this moment um, because of the ways in which um, uh, the internet and these other methods of, of the way in which we connect with one another um, is actually creating new challenges that the human rights community I think is grappling with. And what I think the students in my inv human rights investigations lab are thinking about as well. Um, and I think the last thing I would say about this kind of moment um, is to recognize how fragile democracy is, even in a country like ours, in which we felt very passionate in some cases about the sort of stability of our institutions, um, the ways in which fun you know, things function in the government. We could see how fragile some of that is um, when you have power and you have people in who are supposed to be the counterbalance to exertions of power um, are not doing that role, you can see, quite frankly, how fragile democracy is. And so I think it's this is going to be a very interesting time for, um, for those who do engage in human rights work in this country and I think internationally as well. What does this transition mean? Um, is it a new day? How do we continue to actually live in a world in which human rights is not an afterthought, but it actually becomes our norm. So anyways, I just sort of wanted to address that, um, uh, what, I, what I'm referring to as sort of the white elephant in the room, I'm, I'm, uh, because I think this is something we all need to be monitoring and watching closely for the sake of not only our democracy, but for the sake of human rights. And so because I can't see you, and I know there's a lot of you in the room, um, I wanted to do this poll uh, very quickly to exactly to figure out who's in this shared space with me. And so you'll see there in, um, 
in the chat, or that I guess has been put in the poll there, a um, couple of questions that I would like to know. One being, um, you know, what's your affiliation to UC Santa Cruz? Uh, the second being, how many of you are active on social media, in, uh, pay, posting at least once a day, for instance? Um, if you're active on social media, how many of you have posted without maybe thinking twice about what you retweeted or reposted? Um, and then the last one is just kind of a fun one, like, do we even remember the world before the internet? So I'll give you a minute, just a, a few minutes, seconds to uh, answer those. Well, wonderful. Well, welcome alumni, current students, faculty, staff, UC Santa Cruz parents, and other. We were trying to think of another word for other, but you know, hopefully you guys know what that means. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm delighted to be in conversation um, with you. Um, so you can see in the second question about how many are active on social media posting at least once a day, we have kind of a split, um, you know, uh, audience here in the room with um, just about 37% here uh, who post actively um, and others who are either not on social media or less active. That's very um, interesting and curious. And then um, the other question here about, um, you know, read uh, posting without thinking um, about what you're what you have seen. Um, I'm glad to see that most had answered no, because I think this is a very common problem that we're seeing now um, on the internet is just seeing something that, that upsets us and we, we don't think twice about what we're retweeting and, re and reposting. So it looks like um, uh, people in the virtual room have good digital literacy skills. <laughs> and do you remember the world before the internet? Um, uh, about 80% of us do. So yes, our world has, has really changed. Um, a lot uh, since the uh, dawn of the internet. Thank you so much for, um, for, for answering those polls, for those questions. Um, I now want to talk about um, a little bit about my research timeline. And um, this kind of gives you a better sense of how I approach my work uh, today. And so, um, and so I start. I, I sort of kind of start from the beginning in terms of how did I even stumble across this um, sort of human rights advocacy and human rights work in general. And part of what you know, when I graduated from college, um, I went to Santa Clara University over in the Bay Area. And part of what I was learning there was my place in the world. I think you know it was the first time being away from uh, my family and just really figuring out who I am and what I'm meant to do. And part of what was really important about that period is I learned, you know, how to do sort of what I think of as college-based activism. Like, how do you mobilize your peers to actually care about a particular issue? How do you, um, in fact, try and um, get the administration to sort of meet your demands? And so it was a really, really, um, you know, I grew a lot in that time as an undergrad. I was doing some volunteer work in the Bay Area too around domestic violence, um, volunteering at battered women's shelters. And so I was learning a lot about the, the epidemic of violence that we have in this country. And so with all of those experiences, I you know, graduate from, from college and I'm moving to San Francisco. And one of my mentors says to me, you, know, you should go to the 1995 United Nations World Conference on Women in Beijing. China and I thought, what, you know, um, what, how, how, how do you even do that? I had no idea what that even meant. And um, she had gone to the UN World Conference on Women in Nairobi and was very, um, found that to be a very life altering experience and said, you know, you're just graduating from college. I'll help you fundraise. I think you should go. I think it'll change your life. And she was not wrong in that. It proved to be one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had in my life um, to have traveled to this uh, country, you know, to have traveled all the way to Beijing, China as a young in my early 20s um, and having this moment in which I was having kind of the 
the, the most rapid education I've ever had in my life, learning about what women were doing all around the world to advance uh, women's human rights. And so it proved to be an incredible uh, time in my life. And, um, and, you know, I'm living in San Francisco at the time. And so I have to find a job because that's what you do after graduation. And I start to work in the area of um, combating domestic violence, specific, you know, all forms of family violence. And I started to work at an organization called the Family Violence Prevention Fund. Uh, now it goes by the name Futures Without Violence. And that was also a really incredible time because I, un I started to understand how important policy and precedents were. Um, what does it mean to advance um, policies that actually ensure that um, in a family who's experiencing violence in the home, uh, that for instance, someone doesn't lose their job over that? Um, how do you work with healthcare officials and healthcare um, you know, uh, practitioners and actually equip them with the tools to recognize when they have someone in their, in their doctor's office who may actually be a victim of violence? Um, how do you work with immigration officers to ensure that women who are going through potentially um, a refugee process uh, are actually um, recognized and having, you know, there's sort of an, uh, an understanding if this, if a woman is fleeing violence, domestic violence, that is as serious as political violence. And so it was incredible to actually see and be in the sort of conversation around how do we make meaningful change in people's lives, but from a policy perspective. And as I mentioned, I, at and as a college student was working at a volunteering at a battered women's shelter. So my understanding of how you combat violence was really just helping women in shelters and, uh, and, and you know, maybe taking care of their kids at the shelter while they maybe went to a support group. So it was very service oriented. Um, but my job at the Family Violence Prevention Fund, like now Futures Without Violence, gave me a totally new way to think about how do you actually address the epidemic of domestic violence um, um, from a policy and a legislative perspective. So in addition to doing that, I was also engaged with a number of young um, activists trying to think about what does young women's human rights mean and what do immigrant rights mean and what do girls' rights mean? One of the things that we had sort of talked about as a, as a group of young, um, of young people living in San Francisco was that a lot of programs were either geared towards very young girls, um, so in elementary school or maybe high school, or much older um, women. And there was our kind of generation of 20 somethings that felt like we weren't actually finding support from different organizations. And so we became affiliated with a, with a women's uh, rights organization, San Francisco, who said, well, what do you want? Like, imagine, like, what would a program look like for you? How can we help you make that happen? And it was such an incredible opportunity as a young person to just basically be told, imagine, vision, let's, let's, let's make this happen. And so it was incredible to actually be part of that space and to actually be told um, you, you, you can uh, sort of shape this program as, as you see fit from your perspective and we will help realize it for you. And so I had this kind of, you know, a great college experience and now these great years in San Francisco. And then I was itching to go to graduate school. And part of what I wanted to do in graduate studies was to really think about what I was witnessing and experiencing in San Francisco, now engaged in community activism, not just college-based activism. And I couldn't quite frankly, shake the memories of Beijing. They were, it, it was such a life-changing experience for me. And I wanted to understand what does it mean for all of these thousands of women from all over the world to come and convene, to network, to meet, to just celebrate, to dance, to, um, you know, to demand a better world um, for women. And so it was a really, you know, so that, that's sort of lingering on my mind. And so, all of that together shaped my trajectory in graduate school. And so this is when I set, you know, when I sort of charted a, a terrain for being what I uh, consider myself today as being a human rights scholar. And then, you know, you do the kind of 
academic thing and you know you finish graduate school and you find your postdoc in my case and tenure track positions um and so a lot of in that period is just figuring out how to the research that i was doing in graduate school how to in fact make that better um, in order to uh secure tenure and so then that happens and then i get tenure and then i think wow i have a new opportunity actually to craft another program of research. Um, and at that point in my life, and tenure was a few years ago, I really wanted to intentionally think about how do I craft this program of research that involves students in meaningful ways. And that to me was so important because I think up until that point, you know, once you finish graduate school and you're, you're on the tenure track, a lot of it is like, you don't have time to think about ways in which you maybe wanna work with cohorts of students in, in your research. Some professions are more set up to, to be like that, but at, at that point, um, I hadn't really had the opportunity to do that. And so it was such a, a, a moment in which I could just sort of sit back and think what do I want? What do I want for my students? Um, what do I want for myself? Um, how can I take this human rights uh, scholarship into a new direction? And that's how uh, you will learn, as you will learn today, about the Human Rights Investigations Lab. Um, did I go the wrong way? Sorry. And so then this is my, um, you know, what I think about uh, the sort of core um, pillars of my research that still are present in, um, in the lab, uh, in the investigations lab, one being human rights organizing that has always, always fascinated me to, because a, as a country, we're very much um, embedded in the um, civil rights discourse. We think about ourselves as a, as a civil rights, um, you know, we think about the civil rights movement. But as I was learning um, in San Francisco, you know, human rights gives us a, a more broader understanding of what kinds of demands we can, what kinds of expectations we can have, what kinds of demands we can have, et cetera. So I always have been fascinated about this method of organizing. And then I think about it in relationship to um, what we talk about in scholarship is transnational feminism. So this, this engagement, this feminist engagement that does not limit itself to a specific national context necessarily. And then the other sort of body of work that, uh, that I grapple with um, known as intersectionality. And that being that, you know, women's organizing and women's rights are not experienced or advocated for in the same way. It depends on what kind of social position you have um, in, uh, in one's respective society. So thinking about human rights organizing in relationship to this kind of transnational or global feminism in relationship to understanding uh, different uh, social locations for women. And then the other sort of core element of my research that I've always been very um, interested in is power. And I talk about it as multi-directional power. Um, and I do that intentionally because we talk, we often think about power as linear, you know, like you get further in your career and you accumulate power or you get older and you accumulate power. Um, we think about hierarchies a lot. And so what I do in my work is really conceptualize power as expansively as possible. And so not only do I not think about it in a linear way, I recognize that we have power from the top up, top down, so maybe more oppressive and dominant power, but we also have this power that's from the bottom up. And this is um, really a way to think about how uh, communities who we maybe think of power, uh, think of on, on one level as powerless, can actually mobilize in such a way in which they are quite powerful. And so I've always been sort of interested in those two pillars. And so that's the cover of my book there on the right, um, Anti-Racism and Feminist Activism Inside the UN. Um, I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm always have been intrigued with power, hence the title Power Interrupted. Um, and I use that word intentionally because I think when we think about an entity like the United Nations, which is a massive, a massive multilateral institution, uh, we tend to think about it as, um, we, don't, we tend to miss, I think, some of the ways in which activists who are engaged in that forum and in that, uh, in that institution are actually doing some pretty uh, transformative work. And so I think about it as interrupting power because they're interrupting the power of governments. 
And so um, I think, you know, another point to think about here um, is like, what do I even mean by human rights accountability? Um, and one way that I think about this is to actually think about like, what is the meaning of human rights? And when I talk about human rights in my classes and in the investigations lab, I often think I often have the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights be the starting point. And I'm really clear with students, like this is just a, a point of departure, but it's not something that we should limit ourselves to. And so when we think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and those of you who've never read it, I would encourage you to do so, um, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of, um, uh, of language and framing and, um, and, uh, artic and, and things that it advocates for that is actually quite uh, relevant today. And so even though it was a document in 1948, there's still a lot of resonance today. And so when we think about what is human rights, that's where that's usually where I start off with students, but I, I I try and emphasize with them that it doesn't necessarily mean that's where we limit ourselves to, because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was not meant to be the aspiration; it was meant to be the minimum. And so, when you think about that document and you think about the human rights treaties that follow, when you think about who is accountable, you typically think of governments are accountable or institutions are accountable. Um, different kinds of government or global agencies are accountable. So it seems very clear in terms of who's accountable for ensuring that those rights are protected. But I also want uh, everyday people to understand that they are also accountable for human rights. And so when we think about um, the ways in which we are witnessing human rights um, abuses on our social media, on the news, when we think about how um, millions of people now just take out their cell phone to record something because they know what they're seeing is not right. That's a, that is trying to, uh, you know, that is a form for me of witnessing and that's a form of testifying that you are seeing a human rights um, you know, abuse taking place and that you are wanting to ensure um, that it's, it's seen by the world, it's recognized by the world and that someone eventually is held accountable for that. I think the other thing that I would add here quickly um, in terms of what is human rights, um, I, I teach my students too about um, indigenous, a little bit about indigenous cosmology. So meaning indigenous worldviews about who is alive and who has rights. And so in there, I introduce them to the rights to mother earth um, coming out of Bolivia in particular that talk about our accountability as humans to the earth. Um, because we cannot live without the earth. We cannot live without clean air and clean water and, you know, uh, healed, uh, you know, land and, and, and what have you. And so that makes, we're accountable for ensuring that, um, that the planet is okay, um, that mother earth is okay. And this, and the, this kind of uh, document also gives students um, a way to recognize that um, there is no human rights if we don't actually also recognize our responsibility to protecting, um, protecting the environment and protecting the earth. And the thing I always try and say to my students in class and in the lab is it's really important to remember uh, that justice has no expiration date. I think when we talk about accountability and we want someone accountable now because there's injustice happening right now, um, that's typically not how it works. But if we recognize that accountability um, is not does not have an expiration date, that you can in fact still achieve justice for uh, wrongdoing um, 10 years from now, five, and that may feel unsatisfying, but then when it happens, it's really not unsatisfying. Um, that to recognize that justice has no expiration date. And if it has no expiration date, that means uh, you can be held accountable for human rights abuses, even when you're no longer in a position of power, like even when you're no longer um, uh, maybe engaged in those acts of um, abuses. And so all of that together is when I think about human rights accountability um, and it's evolving new terrain, I wanna be really clear about, I'm talking about human rights in a pretty expansive way. And so, like I said, I get to this point in my um, career where uh, you know, I secure tenure, 
Um, I'm now able to craft this meaningful, you know, I'm trying to think about ideas about how to integrate students and enhance their learning in a meaningful way. I become appointed as the director of the Research Center for the Americas, which is based in the Division of Social Sciences. It's a 30 year research center in, um, at UC Santa Cruz. It's got a, an incredible sort of legacy. And now I was charged with taking care of this organization, being its steward as I like to think about it. And so I'm at this point in my career where I can craft a new program of research. I get this appointment to be the director of the research center and I can start doing some vision work. I can start thinking about what, how do I create something meaningful um, and, and use the legacy of this um, research center as folded into that. So at the time then I end up actually kind of corny enough um, reading the UC mission, the University of California mission. And this is just a part of the mission. I would encourage you to actually read the mission in its entirety. But this part of the mission, this distinctive mission of the university is to serve society as a center of higher learning, providing long-term societal benefits through transmitting advanced knowledge, discovering new knowledge, and functioning as an active working repository of organized knowledge. And so that really resonated with me because I thought, okay, how do I think about my research and creating a meaningful experience for students that achieves not only the mission of the University of California, but also the mission of the research center, which is meant to you know, enhance and advance understandings of the hemisphere of the Americas in robust ways. And so then from that, we have um, you know, the Human Rights Investigations Lab comes to be. And so the lab is born um, last year in fall of 2019. Uh, it took me about nine months to get it really off the ground. Um, and by that, I mean establishing the partnerships I needed to make it work, um, getting the funding I needed to make it work, um, you know, all of the, the sort of logistical things that need to happen when you open a lab like this. And so uh, this Human Rights Investigations Lab for me really embodies uh, the mission of the University of California, and it really embodies the mission of the Research Center for the Americas. And so uh, we talk about ourselves as harnessing digital technologies to address alleged human rights violations in order to achieve accountability for communities adversely affected by these abuses. And so what that means is because there are human rights abuses happening on our screens, they're happening and you know, we're witnessing it on social media. What do we do with that? And this is this new terrain that I'm talking about. Before you would read about it in a newspaper or you would hear about it from maybe if you had family who lived in another part of the world, you would hear about it from family members. But now people upload um, abuses on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, they're sharing information in these ways. And so it became, it, it was clear to me in terms of where uh, human rights um, sort of was going was to actually think about this digital terrain. And so what the lab does is it offers uh, digital verification support to non-governmental organizations, to news outlets and to other advocacy partners that are initiating open source investigations. And I'll talk a little bit more about what open source means in just a minute. But part of what we do in the lab is engage in these external partnerships with these um, entities that could actually benefit from, um, from the work that we're doing in the lab. So for instance, we'll get a request that says, we heard about um, an incident of um, police violence in this community in Honduras, and we don't actually know if it happened because the community is, is telling us different things. Can you just comb the internet and see what kind of evidence you can find? And so the students can do that now. They know how to go onto the internet and how to actually locate information to verify that an incident of violence, for instance, actually happened. Um, and so that's what I mean by digital verification support and how those partnerships with non-governmental organizations can work. So we've been pinged by all of, all of these types, by non-governmental organizations, by news outlets, and by other advocacy human rights partners that have heard about the lab because it didn't actually take that long for a word to get out about us, um, who now come to us for, um, for help about monitoring things online. 
Um, and then the other thing that the lab does is, uh, and one of the things that you'll see in uh, later in, in tonight is we invest, we initiate our own investigations. And oftentimes this is of, out of students' interest. And this is something that happened with the uprisings in Chile last year, where students um, wanted to do something about what they were seeing and witnessing online. And you'll see some of the, the fruits of that um, research um, later uh, in, the, in the lecture tonight. So this human rights investigation then lab comes to be, um, and it, it, it actually ends up being this uh, plat or this space in which students can um, acquire digital literacy skills um, that uh, that actually help them think about uh, what they're seeing online, what's truth, um, what maybe has been uh, doctored and falsified and, and therefore not true. Um, it gives them a, a, an opportunity to do a lot of this kind of work. And so, you know, I, I was fortunate um, and I am very fortunate to have um, sort of an incredible amount of support from the university for this lab to launch. Um, and so one, you know, I just sort of want to recognize the people who are part of the team. Um, Dr. Saskia Nomberg dunkel who is um, a research manager at the Humanities Institute. Um, she serves as a, as a lab's research advisor. Um, she is a, a a pretty serious human rights scholar herself. Um, and, you know, what's uh, interesting about, and this is I always, you know, tell graduate students, academia is very small. Um, I met Saskia when she was a graduate student um, at uh, one of our, you know, where we're both sociologists at our uh, professional association. And I was very impressed with the work that she was doing in, uh, in Colombia. And it just happens because the universe is the way it is that she ends up with a job at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, she arrived at the same time as I was about to launch the lab. And it just was very, very um, fortunate and fortuitous for me that, um, that she's here and is able to actually be another mentor for the students and um, teaching them how to be um, human rights researchers and scholars as well. Uh, the students reflect a really wide variety of fields and disciplines in the lab. Um, so I have here listed a number of the departments that they come from. Um, and, you know, they represent four divisions this year. The last year they represented three, arts, social sciences, and humanities. And this year we've had students who are in PBSI, so the physical biological sciences, who are now part of, um, are part of the team. And so that has probably been one of the greatest um, joys is to bring together um, these students from such varied um, majors together and working together um, to, uh, on these human rights investigations. And, you know, I just have to also kind of recognize that, um, you know, like I mentioned before, the support has been pretty, um, you know, amazing from the campus. And so as much as I, you know, would love to think I can do everything by myself, I can't. And, um, and so I'm fortunate to be at this campus in which I not only got a lot of uh, funding support from different units on campus, um, but just a lot of expertise that I could tap and that I could rely on, that I could consult with. And so these are just some of the, you know, funders from the campus and the supporters that have ensured uh, the labs, um, I think, extremely successful first year and looking like an extremely bright second year as well. Um, and then I would say that, uh, you know, we are the second human rights investigations lab. The first one was opened at UC Berkeley. And um, UC Berkeley has been a really fantastic partner um, for us here at UC Santa Cruz. And so the colleagues there um, were very generous in sharing all of the materials they needed um, and they used to open up. And when I was in conversation with them about wanting to open a lab in Santa Cruz, their lab is affiliated with their school of law ours was going to be affiliated with the division of social sciences and it became really clear that we you know we could open this lab and give it our uc santa cruz spin um, because we do have so much expertise on this campus about this region in the americas and so it was you know we, we refer to each, uh, uh, each other as affectionately as our sister labs um, and um, and it's been really just a total pleasure 
working with my colleagues at UC Berkeley um, to uh, to have this lab come into existence. Then we have, you know, we have incredible actually support from external organizations too. Hunchley is um, is a is a pro, is a I guess company that actually a lot of human rights investigators rely on their um, on their platform to. Uh, systematically organize the evidence that they're finding online. They're one of our supporters and have donated to us. Bellingcat are the leaders in open source research investigations. They're a big supporter and actually just trained our students uh, for this year. And then Facebook Research also has given us access to their uh, CrowdTangle platform so that we can continue to do research on there. So I feel like very fortunate to have the kind of incredible support that I have um, for this lab. And so what is open uh, source research? What is online open source research? So it literally means any information that's available, publicly available on the internet. So we don't necessarily, we don't access information that's behind a, behind a, fi a firewall or a paywall or that requires us to engage in like hacking or something like that. We don't do that at the Human Rights Investigations Lab uh, for a number of reasons, but, uh, but it's incredible how much information is actually available online, um, publicly available online, if you know how to find it. And so the uh, information that the students are accessing and are able, and collating and putting together for various investigations, um, types of information include news reports that they come across, um, expert and non-governmental organizational reports, uh, social media content, um, uh, image and sound recordings, geospatial imagery, you know, Google Maps, that kind of Google Earth type of imagery, other kinds of mapping documents. There's just a ton of information online um, that students are accessing and collating and synthesizing um, as they do their investigations. The other thing that, uh, that is required in online open source research are a whole set of uh, techniques. One being discovery, like how do you, you know, you can't just, uh, the internet is a massive, you know, space, right? So you can't just search for with a couple of words and find the information you want. So part of what the students have learned is how do you do these targeted searches online to get the information you need to answer the research question you're after. And so, um, students you know, know how to now do some of the, how to use search engines to maximum effect. Um, they learn how to actually go on the social media uh, platforms, mostly Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and they know how to actually find relevant postings there. Um, another technique that the students have learned is called geolocation. So if you see a post um, and you're not totally sure if that uh, incident happened in the location that the that the post is saying, the students uh, are now able to geolocate it in the world. So they can look at an image, they've learned how to analyze an image, they've learned how to now open it up in Google Earth or Google Maps and try and figure out where in the world this is happening. And so this, uh, you know, it's basically geographically locating where an image took place and from what angle. Uh, the other technique that the students have learned is called chronolocation. So that being uh, being able to estimate the time um, of, of when an image was taken. And that's a way to verify that if the post says this incident happened at 11 a.m., the students can look at the image and verify that in fact that's accurate or they discover it's actually not accurate. And so therefore this is a post that is not, um, is not actually um, accurate in telling the truth. Um, the other technique that students learn in the lab is network analysis, and this is trying to understand the relationship between perpetrators and victims. Um, and this, it, this becomes extremely handy when the students are doing investigations around military violence. Um, and so if they're looking at military violence in another country, they now know how to um, not only uh, sort of understand the military structure um, of another country, but they know now how to actually think about um, connections within that military or connections across perpetrators. And then the other technique, um, and, these are, and these are just some samplings, they, they actually learn quite a bit more is called digital mapping. And this is where students um, uh, learn how to do some data visualization. So they have learned that there are 
for instance, um, extractive industries that are targeting this part of the Amazon, they know now how to go onto these digital mapping platforms and to actually trace whether or not that's happening and to what extent that's happening. And so it's a method of actually visualizing the data um, that they are in fact um, seeing and, and collating and collecting. And, you know, I talk about open source research for the public good. Um, and that kind of goes back to my earlier point about there is no expiration date for justice because um, uh, when you, you can actually channel um, and use this open source research to hold um, perpetrators accountable for human rights abuses, that's good for everybody. Whether that perpetrator is in um, Chile or whether that perpetrator is in the United States. And so this I think is a really important value uh, that we have in the lab. Um, in terms of what the lab provides students, um, I sort of think about it in three key ways. One being um, you know, education, obviously. Um, the students are part of a weekly seminar with me and with Dr. Dunkel. And, um, and this is where we uh, talk to them about uh, you know, human rights and uh, sort of on a philosophical level, on a theoretical level. And then it's an opportunity to hone in on their research skills. Um, and then they also meet separately in their own research team. So they have a weekly meeting with me and then a research team meeting that I also go to um, to talk about their specific investigations. And the other part uh, of our educational component in the lab is um, really integrating a resiliency component because it's, uh, really clear that when you're asking students to repeatedly view difficult content, that, that can be traumatic. Um, and so we're really mindful of making sure that we're not um, harming students. And so we teach students and talk about resiliency quite openly um, to make sure that they're not um, being affected through secondary trauma. And in fact, earlier today, I was talking to a student who, um, you know, was very, uh, was aware that she was viewing a difficult content too much. And so had to step away from it. And that's exactly what we try and teach the students is that there, there can be a, a point where maybe you're not sleeping well, maybe you're uh, irritable. Um, some of it might be because you, you have viewed that video, that violent video too many times. And so maybe you don't wanna look at it anymore. Um, and so we teach students on how to navigate some of that um, in the lab or in, you know, in, the, in the seminars. Um, the other thing that I think the lab provides students is, um, you know, technical and research support to uh, global human rights partners for the public good. And so, you know, because we're working on real life cases, because we're working with real life partners, uh, because we are offering this kind of support um, on, on a real life case of what's happening right now, this kind of experience is really um, is really moving for the students because they can actually see in real time um, the impact of the work that they're doing. And then I think the other thing uh, that the lab provides for them are sort of new skills and new career opportunities. So the students are, as I said in the slide before, kind of gaining this whole new skill set. How do you verify something? How do you make sure it's actually legitimate? How do you geolocate? How do you chronolocate? How do you, you know, comb the internet um, and social media to get uh, to get in search for the truth? Um, those critical digital literacy skills are leading to new career paths, whether that's in academia or whether that's in journalism or whether that's even um, at places like the UN, which is now opening up uh, positions in open source research. And so this has been really exciting for me to see that, um, that the skills that and the experience that we're offering the students is actually opening up a whole new career trajectory for them. And so we, we, we take that quite seriously in being sure that if students who have um, maybe gained a lot and have, um, have really been moved by the work that they're doing in the lab, we try and figure out how to help them do that next step in sort of charting off a new career path. So those are just some of the things that I think the lab provides um, the students uh, who join. I'd also say um, I have very high expectations of the students. Um, and so I think the lab uh, also provides them um, 
that kind of um, understanding that I expect a lot of them and, and I put in a lot and I expect a lot. And I feel like that actually provides students, I, I guess I should frame it like this, students have all risen to the occasion of that expectation. And so the students who have applied to be, because you have to apply to be part of the lab, you have to get interviewed, it's a whole to do, because I'm very, very careful about who becomes part of the lab, because I want to be sure that that's the right fit um, and that students are ready for the experience. I'm really clear that I expect a lot from them. Um, and the kind of student that is applying to be part of the lab is uh, a student who really is eager to make a difference, is really eager and motivated um, to, to make a difference. And so it's been a really exciting, um, it's been an exciting um, time to build, this, uh, to build this lab. And, you know, this is just like a recap. So when I talk about high expectations, this is kind of what I mean. <laughs> um, it's a recap of our first year. Um, when you added up all the time that we were in seminars and research team meetings, extra meetings, and independent research, students put in about 410 hours total in the academic year um, for, uh, you know, for in, the, in the lab. And so that's a pretty remarkable investment. And so the students give a lot. They give a lot of their time. Um, they're very serious about the work. And, um, and it shows when you actually accumulate the hours, it's an incredible, incredible commitment. In the first year, we had 20 students. This year, we have 25. Um, in the first year, the students came from 12 departments, uh, as I said, in the social sciences, humanities, and the arts. And this year, we have students who have joined us from um, PBSI. So in our first year, we completed five human rights cases, and we also translated and transcribed material from Spanish and Portuguese to English. Um, a lot of our cases um, are highly confidential because of their delicate nature. And so some of them um, uh, we can't ever disclose. And oftentimes they're, it's because they're connected to a legal um, situation, a legal case or a pending legal case. And so there's a lot of delicacy around that. And I think the fact that students um, understand that, that they understand that they're actually managing cases um, and working on cases that are actually quite um, uh, serious, they really rise to the occasion and understand that, um, that these partners rely on us and they also very much rely on our discretion. And so what I'm gonna show you here is um, an investigation that we can make public that the students participated in last year. As I mentioned before, the students um, were really um, uh, mesmerized, troubled, um, curious about what was happening in Chile last year. In October of 2019, there were massive protests happening. And what actually happened for us is there was a lot of UC students who were studying abroad in Chile who were then telling our students like you can I I can't even tell you what's happening right now in Santiago it's it's like it's incredible I, I don't even like I can't believe I'm part of history and our students kind of got caught up in that and they said I think we can do an investigation and part of what they were troubled with was reading all about all of the um, incidents of um, abuse that were happening in the targeting of activists. And so this is one, this is a video that was done um, by the UC Santa Cruz media team, Nick Gonzalez in particular, um, about this investigation and why they wanted to do it. So I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you now. Starting in October, 2019, Chile experienced some of the largest protests in its history. The protests started over an increase in the Metro fare, but in reality, it was more so about 30 years of societal frustration dating all the way back to the Pinochet dictatorship. And, you know, there was a lot going on at that time too, a lot of socioeconomic barriers to a lot of people, and that all culminated into these very um, loud and sometimes violent protests. There was a lot of police brutality going on. It really captured the students' imagination, and they realized they were being a witness to history. And so they came to me and they came to my counterparts at UC Berkeley and said, can we do an investigation about this? And we started, you know, on social media, trying to see who 
school was getting hurt or what was going on, how many protesters were getting hurt, was this, we had bigger questions like, is this systemic, is this planned, and who's, who's doing this? So at the Human Rights Investigations Lab, we are aiming to train the next generation of human rights advocates. So a lot of what we do in the Human Rights Investigation Lab is open source work um, for our NGO partners. We gather all evidence that is available to anybody. So anyone who just goes on Google and does any search, anything that comes up is publicly available information. We have three reports coming out based on the students' research. One report documents 25 lives lost during the uprisings of fall 2019, early 2020. The second report traces the last week in the life of a very heavily involved social political activist who had quite a bit of online posts that we were able to pull together the last week of his life. And the third report is a joint investigation with UC Berkeley in which we compare and contrast the protest timeline along with the Chilean authority narrative about why those protests were happening. And in doing so, we were able to show the real contention between Chilean authorities and the reasons why people felt they needed to hit, be in the streets. For me, this is really the new terrain for human rights accountability. And so I often talk about the lab and the work that we do as being for the public good. Because I, as I tell the students, when you can hold someone accountable for human rights violations, that's good for everybody. If we are collectively monitoring and trying to hold governments and institutions accountable for their actions, that ultimately will get us to the end goal of hopefully achieving justice and um, protecting human dignity. Starting in October. There you go. So that gives you a little bit of uh, insight into um, a little perspective into our one of our public reports um, that's now going to go in the chat, the different reports that we uh, published um, in the summer based on the research that the students did in the lab. And the feedback that we've been getting from the students um, has really been, um, you know, quite um, affirming and that uh, all the work that we've been putting into the lab have been worth it. Um, the students uh, are very moved by participating in this work and it's also quite moving for them to see their work published um, and shared uh, throughout, um, you know, with the support of UC Santa Cruz. And so these are just some of the quotes from students who have shared uh, how meaningful the experience has been with them. One of the things that I think, uh, you know, I really sort of take to heart is how much the students are learning in the classroom about human rights abuses um, and now finding, feeling like they have an opportunity to, um, to do something about what they're learning and, and, and engaging in these uh, human rights investigations. I think the other part that I find very, um, you know, uh, rewarding and affirming from what the students um, have shared with me is this other quote where it says, it's rewarding to know that our research helps to tell the stories of people and communities whose voices are silenced by those in positions of power. And I think that is what uh, the investigations offer the students is, um, is a way to think about how the skills that they're acquiring in the lab can actually help um, in a productive way um, in elevating and challenging um, the silences that go around with, um, with human rights abuses um, and so forth. The other ones, of course, I really see our work as shaping a, a unique vision of how to resolve human rights violations in the digital age. Um, and as an undocumented student, I feel empowered to be able to digitally transcend borders and to learn open source skills in order to further the work of human rights in the Americas. And so uh, the students um, have been um, really sort of moved by the experience and also, um, as you can see, um, uh, understand the difference and the impact that they're making. And so um, any kind of lab like this, I think has to also be guided by a set of principles. And in this case, our principles are um, justice, ethics, accountability, advocacy, innovation, and emancipation. Those, those values, those principles guide the work that we do in the lab. It guides and shapes 
the education that we're trying to present for the students and offer the students. It shapes the investigations that we take on and some that we cannot take on. Um, it helps think about that as our sort of core values um, in the lab as being really important and meaningful. And so when I talk about this new terrain for justice, basically what I'm talking about here is how this digital realm, the internet, has really created this new, um, this new platform in which that we need to think about how do we secure justice? And part of that is because everyday people are turning to the internet, right? They're uploading their videos and images of alleged human rights abuses and wrongdoing. What are we gonna do about that? When we witness it, what do we do about that? Um, how do we think about um, uh, actually figuring out how to um, amplify um, in, a, in, a, in a research capacity, what we're witnessing online and holding people accountable. I think the other part that's the new terrain is searching for the truth. As I mentioned at the beginning, the disinformation and misinformation campaigns are, uh, are, have intensified. How do you know what you're seeing online is actually uh, legitimate? Um, the students understand how to question and scrutinize what they're seeing online now and how to collate that uh, that data syst systemically. And then I think the third uh, part of the new terrain is this actual proactive engagement, right? How do you acquire these open source research skills and how do you channel maybe the frustration of what you're seeing and helplessness that sometimes students feel into action? How do we actually, um, uh, you know, bring all of this together to, um, to participate in this new terrain for justice um, and helping um, a, a communities all around the Americas. And so that's my presentation. I would invite you um, to also join us and partner with us in helping continue to train what we think of as the next generation of digital human rights investigators um, here at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you so much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, most inspiring. I just want to remind people to put their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. We have, however, for starters, a fairly long one. Okay. Uh, it's, we're going to lead up to a question about how we can take what you find into action, tangible results. And this is specifically around uh, Bolivia. Mm. Uh, so the Declaration of Mother Earth Rights in Bolivia brought hope to historically abused land by multinationals and our own governments. Unfortunately, the result of this declaration has been nothing of what it was supposed to accomplish. Furthermore, over 14 years, the president has been raping the land for profit and is, that has reached unprecedented levels. Uh, including intentional set fires in the Amazon region. Unfortunately, there was no clear pronunciation from the international or scientific community throughout these years regarding these and other abuses. The question then, uh, mm -hmm. how can all this public information be used to produce real and tangible action and results? I think it's a brilliant question because I hear this a lot um, in terms of uh, these declarations don't have enough power, they don't have enough impact, they don't make enough of a difference. And I think that's a valid critique. Um, and I also think that oftentimes they don't have the, the weight that they should because we don't have the right people in elected positions, whether that be the president or whether that be other sort of local officials. But this question about how can all this public information be used to produce real and tangible actions and results, I think this is where the partnerships with, um, with partners in these communities is really fundamental. Um, and so if you take a case like Bolivia, um, it becomes really important in this kind of work to be sure that we have a partner in Bolivia that is guiding our research. And so sometimes that is um, you know, uh, collating and organizing the data so that they can actually use it in a potential lawsuit. Um, that also happens and there's legal mechanisms in which those things can happen. But I think that to me is the way to use that public information is to be sure that you have the right partnership in place um, to get them the information that they need for 
whether it's legal cases or to pass lo local ordinances or, um, or to in some ways just elevate um, and raise awareness. Because oftentimes, as much as we think people are aware of what's happening in the world, not everybody's online, not everybody's seeing some of this information. And so that to me seems like a really important um, piece of it. But I think it's, a, it's an excellent question because um, time is running out. I think, um, I think we all uh, uh, should be feeling that very urgently right now. That question, by the way, was from Mauricio. We have also a question from Michelle. I could see a connection with the American Immigration Lawyers Association, Asylum Law Section, and the UC Hastings Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. As an immigration attorney defending asylum seekers, I often find a need to fill in the blanks mm -hmm. of country condition information in English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, thank you, Michelle, for that question. Um, or for that comment, um, I think that those kinds of partnerships are really, really important um, to uh, to solidify and to nurture, because oftentimes, you know, a place like the American Immigration Lawyers Association, a lot of people are in some ways um, already at capacity in terms of trying to collect information. And so if they partner with us or if they partner with the UC Berkeley lab, we're able to actually get some, um, some we are, we're actually able to support ongoing work. And so we do that also in a lot of other um, capacities, but I think those kinds of partnerships are essential um, and really uh, enrich the experience. So next question from Christopher. Has the proliferation of cameras and social media mm. a net positive or negative? On one uh, hand, it has provided a place to organize and share abuse to get help. On the flip side, misinformation are easier to pass around and abusers can also network and organize. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, it's a great question. I, and it's often, um, you know, often anything that we um, uh, indulge in, if you will, has a positive and a negative. Um, I think the, the social media platforms, um, depending on what the issue is, ha has been the only way to amplify uh, wrongdoing. Um, and so to me, that's a positive to actually be able to um, post something uh, online in which um, uh, you can call attention to some kind of ongoing atrocity or some kind of wrongdoing. And so that to me seems like a really, really important, um, uh, you know, benefit, if you will, because oftentimes these, these locations can be too dangerous for an investigative team to go into. And so the only way to know what's going on is through um, you know, the use of camera and going onto social media. But of course, the negative is real. Um, as I mentioned before, with the uh, proliferation of misinformation and disinformation campaigns, um, you can see how easily swayed people can be um, if, they're, if they don't scrutinize what they're viewing. And this is the digital literacy skills that the students in the lab are acquiring. Um, because I think uh, we too often don't uh, take those uh, kind of critical thinking skills or that scrutiny to what we're seeing online and we, and we have to. Um, and we have to, in some ways, um, incorporate that kind of curriculum, I think, into uh, from, from elementary school on up. Um, how do you scrutinize what you're seeing online? Not everything you see online is obviously um, valid. And it's important to, to be sure that uh, we have those skills to decipher that. Take, uh, I'll take the next question. So we have a, a question from Jay, and this is, uh, you know, this is uh, getting closer to home, and, and maybe it brings up some of the topics of how you do, uh, how you do your research on domestic issues. Um, he asks uh, if if charges can be filed against the current president uh, for, mm. he says, concentration camps uh, enacted on the border. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I think. Um, this will be one to um, to see. I think that uh, you know the ways in which international lawyers are paying attention, the ways in which um, other sort of civil rights lawyers in this country are paying attention. It, it in some ways it remains to be seen. Um, 
but I think uh, I think people are um, collating and collecting information um, to see uh, you know what kind of accountability can be brought um, in terms of in terms of the migration and the and the concentration camps as you call them at the border. Um, this has been extremely distressing for any immigration attorney um, because especially those who are involved in refugee matters, um, the the handling of that could not have been more egregious. Um, and so I, I, I actually believe there's quite a few lawyers on the case. <laughs> oh, there's lots of questions. Okay, uh, we have a question from Grace. Hello, I'm curious if your student researchers have found any particular types of human rights abuses, situations, or environments that are difficult to verify via open source material instances of censorship? Yeah, that's a great question, Grace. Um, in terms of like the Chile investigation they did, um, we had suspected there had been some, a little bit of censorship there in terms of material that was available for us to analyze in October was suddenly gone when we went to go re-verify it in April. Um, so we can't say with certainty that was censorship, but it was curious to us how some of these um, uh, posts uh, disappeared. Um, and, um, and that was uh, uh, an interesting kind of um, moment for us. But in terms of yeah, being difficult to verify, I think uh, the point that I would make there um, is that not everything that not everything can be verified with open source research. So in terms of uh, in terms of our experiences in the lab, we've had successes. So we've been we've been fine completing our investigations. Um, but I just saw Amnesty International um, publish a report on when an open source research takes you to nowhere. So they also have their own digital verification unit, um, and we're talking. And I haven't had a chance to read the article, but I think the more you get into this. Um, you are likely to find um, that you might actually engage in an investigation that doesn't actually give you anything concrete to work with. So it can happen, but it hasn't happened yet for us. I have a question from Adriana. Mm -hmm. Conflicting and disturbing re reports from Nicaragua on human rights conditions. Are you in touch with the Nicaraguan situation? I am in touch um, with a couple of organizations and that's about as much as I can say. <laughs> because it is a pretty delicate situation. Uh, question from Ray. Um, do you know where I can find info on the, uh, well, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, Dam and the binational entity that runs it. American corporations were involved in the construction, but it seems to be findable. It might be there on the internet, but it is a big forest to find a tree. Mm, um, I don't know off the top of my head where you can find that information, but um, but I would be curious um, to sit with that for a little bit and see if I can um, think of maybe a database or something. So, um, so Ray, can I get back to you on that? Are you are you familiar with the issue uh, where that dam is located? I don't know where that dam is located. Okay, yeah, Ray, keep in, keep in touch, and I think you'd like to learn more. Yeah. Um, question from Claire. The lab analyze symbolic content. I noticed acronyms sometimes have more than one meaning. Mm -hmm. Videos which are innocent looking are posted in places which can make them look abusive, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Claire. And so um, this is where that geolocation really comes um, in handy and also ensuring that students have um, uh, a sort of a research uh, notebook to actually note when acronyms are having more than one meaning. So we teach the students how to have like basically a researcher's notebook online. Um, we call it our action log or activity log where the students notice these discrepancies. So for instance, in some cases they are uh, trying to uncover um, a, maybe a military official who's engaged in uh, human rights abuses and they discover through their searches that this guy comes up with like three names. They'll note all of those names and it's actually the same person and they're able to verify that usually after, um, after some time. So yeah, so we try and track all of that. But in terms of analyzing symbolic content, um, I'm guessing you're talking about how, um, uh, are you talking about maybe how images can be doctored? Um, if so, we, we, we go over, um, uh, how students can uh, look and see when uh, images have been altered and in fact falsified in that way. 
Well, that segues into uh, the next question. So maybe you could go a little bit in detail on digital forensics, specifically around video and photo media to find out how they've been faked. Yeah. So there's been some great articles actually on CNN about how to notice when a video has been faked. And so I give that to students as well. But Amnesty has um, a couple of um, tools that we use to verify whether or not a video um, took place in the location that it did. We also teach students, um, and this is really where geolocation um, comes in ha handy and chronolocation, about how you can actually take a video and create a bunch of snapshots or like, you know, like Im still images to then locate its location to see if it actually took place in the in the place that it says it did. And, and if they can verify it in that way, then we consider it, um, you know, kind of past our, our, uh, you know, our, our test in terms of making sure that it's a legitimate, but oftentimes um, uh, they will, or not oftentimes, but seldomly uh, they have found uh, images that they thought were relevant and were actually not um, accurate. And so, uh, so a lot of that is scrutinizing who the source is, you know, uh, where did they post it from? Um, did other people post that same image? Were they calling it the same thing? All of that um, is ways in which we, we think about um, verification. Oh, okay, I see here, Ray added where the location is of the dam, okay. Mm -hmm. Is there, I, this is a question for me actually, I, I thought I heard you say that place and time could sometimes be identified. So if you know the place, how do you, how do you, how do you get the time out of a, a picture? So um, this is a, a process that's called chronolocation and we use um, a program to, uh, called SunCalc, S-U-N-C-A-L-C. And so it basically, uh, you can find a location, um, uh, you tell the time basically through the shadows. And so um, uh, in that Chile report that I shared, um, we noticed the chronolocation of when some of the postings were taking place based on the shadows and they use SunCalc to determine that time. Um, and so the SunCalc will help them determine, um, you know, um, a, an approximate time. It's not perfect, but it at least gives you somewhat of a window. So I see Larry's question here. Should I go ahead and answer that one? Oh, sure. sure. Um, although let's take a, I'm going to take a moment. We did have a question from someone named Betty. Okay. Uh, pointing out uh, that, you know, we shouldn't uh, misuse the word concentration camps. And I, I do want to point out, you know, that was, that was in the words of the person who asked the question. I think we can all acknowledge the special meaning of that word to, you know, people of Jewish descent uh, talking about the Holocaust and the yes. hundreds of concentration camps established at that time. So um, and if you, you can welcome to address that too, if you like, but uh, we have a question from Larry. Has the lab encountered external threats in the course of its work? And if so, how has it dealt with them? So Larry, that's a great question because we take security very, very seriously in the lab. Um, and that is, uh, is, we have not had any kind of external threats um, in, in, that, in, in the way that I think um, can happen when you are, uh, maybe a larger organization like Bellingcat or like Amnesty International. And so, um, and so we have security protocols in place to make sure that the students are safe um, and protected when they are doing their research online. Um, some of it I, I don't necessarily want to disclose on, in a public forum, but we uh, work with our ITS on campus. Um, we consult with external security experts um, at UC Berkeley as well to ensure that we have best practices in the lab. Um, for safety. Yeah, thank you. We do have time for a few more questions. I'd encourage people to keep asking. Uh, maybe I'll I'll just throw in one of my own. I sort of wonder um, about the about the future of of your lab and what you see technology happening over maybe the next ten years. And actually, what what do you need from the technology companies that might might make this work uh, more effective? Yeah, that's a great question. It would be nice if they were more proactive in. Um, in um, labeling disinformation and misinformation campaigns, because that has been really um, uh, a challenge, I think, for um, for open source investigators um, is to really try and um, stop the spread because it spreads quite rapidly. Um, and uh, in terms of like what we need from, I think, uh, tech companies. Uh, part of it, I think, is to um, ensure that they also have a set of um, 
you know, uh, security protocols in place for those of us who are online as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of off the top of my head of what of what I think um, some of these tech companies could do better is really um, is proactively tackling disinformation and misinformation and um, uh, and also thinking about internet security in a more robust way. Okay, Claire has a question. She thanks you for uh, talking about the fake videos. Uh, she was thinking more about how uh, she noticed people seem to post under posts which may not have to do with the same content, crossing mm -hmm. into another social media and posts which cause misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, for example, she noticed a video blaming women under a post which had to do with a power plant or something similar. The video had no bon bad content, especially if we were placed in another and more normal location. Mm. Yeah, that's about that, some of the algorithms, I think, too, um, which I didn't really get into. But yeah, that's that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Claire. So then we have an exciting comment here in my mind. And I think we're gonna end with this. So this is from Jeff. He says he's on the board of a Spanish language media organization with hemispheric reach. How can we work with you? You can email me at hrlab at ucsc.edu and I would be happy to talk to you further. That's hrlab at ucsc.edu. Thanks, Jeff. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you, Silvana, for joining us this evening. Just to remind you, the talk was recorded and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days. Now, after we wrap up here, we want to invite you to a Zoom meeting room to chat with Mike, myself and Professor Falcone and many other participants. We'll be sharing information in the chat and on screen in just a moment. In this after party this evening, we'll make it easy to connect with a number of fellow slugs and steiners, two at a time, in consecutive small group sessions. Join us and gain the perspectives of someone new and if you're lucky and draw the right ticket, you can get the full attention of our slug professor. So another big round of thanks also to the staff of the alumni and special events offices who set up this online forum. Thank you, Cara, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Now our next event is on Monday, December 14th, and it'll feature professor of literature, John Jordan director of the Dickens Project at UCSC. Professor Jordan specializes in Victorian literature and culture, the English novel, literature of South America, South Africa, excuse me, and narrative theory. Now in the meantime, we have many other exciting talks from USC, uh, UCSC coming up soon. Tomorrow, for example, you can get a report on the state of the universe with astronomer Joel Premack. On Thursday, join for a poetry reading with guest Warden Parker. And then next Wednesday in the Craw Lecture Series, climate scientist and professor James Zakos explains how evidence of global warming in the fossil record is helping us to understand how our planet re responds to massive CO2 release events. Check out the website, calendar.ucsc.edu. Okay, th so this is your last chance to get the information to join our after party. Uh, with speed networking and discussions, don't procrastinate further. Copy that link in the chat now. So on behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us and please come back on December 14th for our next virtual event.